Vladimir Horowitz, he's been called the world's finest classical pianist. And for over 50 years, he has mesmerized his audiences the world over with his dazzling virtuosity. He has pushed his romantic musical freedoms to the limit, but he has kept his private life a mystery. Pianist and New York Times feature writer Glenn Plaskin has just finished what's been called the most controversial biography ever written. It's an unauthorized probing portrait of Mr. Horowitz as a virtuoso, as a man torn by self-doubt and sexual ambivalence. The book is called Horowitz. Good morning. Hi. What drew you to Vladimir Horowitz? Partly what we just heard, unbelievable piano playing. As you just said, I was a pianist myself, and Horowitz, I often say, is to the 20th century what Liszt and Paganini were said to have been to the 19th century. What I mean by that is that he combines unheard of digital dexterity with a kind of demonic presence that is unmatched in the 20th century. When he came out onto the stage in the 1940s, people were literally breathless, and so it was his reputation as a pianist, first of all. The fact that he didn't want you to write the book, this is an unauthorized biography, uh, did that not produce some qualms for you? Maybe I shouldn't do this. After all, he doesn't, there, he's what, 81 years old? He'll be 80 in October. Okay. There's no biography ever been written about him. He obviously doesn't like the idea. As his wife says, we're not like Lenny Bernstein. We don't want to be in People magazine. You know, it was an astonishing fact that there'd never been a book about him. In 1978, when I began, there he was on the cover of Newsweek, 60 Minutes, at the White House with President Carter, uh, on a worldwide television broadcast that was seen in 30 countries. And how could there be no book? I went to the library and I looked and uh, no book. So what happened was, First, the book was contracted to an American publisher, and I had never written a book, and uh, I had never had anything published. And I remember going into the William Morris Agency and saying, I'm writing Horowitz's biography. And they said, hmm? And I said, not only that, but for a minimum advance, please, you should ask $50,000. And they said, oh, if you get $10,000, you'll be lucky, because no one's ever heard of you. But I knew that it would take at least three years yeah. to do it. So to make a long story short, I did get the advance. And when I began, I called Horowitz on the phone. And he was very friendly and nice to me. And he said, look, I don't want a book written about my life. The reason he didn't want a book was because, as you know, he's had a very difficult life. He's a reclusive, elusive person. I felt that it was actually a blessing in disguise that he didn't cooperate. Because if he had done so, we wouldn't have been able to tell the true story about his three nervous breakdowns, about his relationship to his daughter, about his marriage, about Tuscanini. All right, let's go into all of those things. His nervous breakdowns. What brought on these nervous breakdowns? Well, as you know, nervous breakdowns are never brought on by one thing. But he is a very sensitive person to begin with. And if you put on a sensitive person the demands of a world-class career, that alone would, might be enough to, to make you nervous. But in 1933, he married Arturo Toscanini's daughter. And Arturo Toscanini was the most famous musician in the world, period. And it was a musical match made in heaven. On earth, it didn't necessarily work too well. The marriage was a stormy one. In 1934, a year later, his daughter Sonia was born. The pressures of childhood. Most important, though, Horowitz uh, got married despite the fact that he was well known, it was well known to his friends and associates that he was homosexual. And this created enormous difficulties and conflicts in his marriage and in his life, the, the disparity between his genuine feelings and what he was expected to do. And in 1936, the thing that tricked off his first nervous breakdown was the fact that he was absolutely positive that there was something wrong with his appendix. His mother had died of a neglected appendix in Russia. His brother George had hanged himself. His brother Jacob had died in the revolution. He came from tragic circumstances. And when uh, the doctor said, there's nothing wrong with it, don't have it taken out, he had it taken out. He was a man of remarkable eccentricity, wasn't he? That's partly created by the media uh, and partly by Horowitz. It wasn't until the 1960s what happened was he retired from 36 to 39, and then 52 to 65, 12 years away from the stage, and then 69 to 74. Now that's 22 years together. That kind of retirement creates a mystique in itself, doesn't mm -hmm. it? And he took advantage of it very cleverly. In what way? Oh, when he began going on tour in the 1970s, he knew that he didn't need his own water purifier. He knew that he didn't need 20 fillets of fish flown f to Miami from New Bedford, Massachusetts. He knew that when he came to Toronto, he didn't need blackout curtains in one of your fine hotels. 
but he brought it all with him and got tremendous attention in the press. He said when he came to Toronto in 1975 that it was as if a ghost was visiting your city. Well, does that mean he really is like Lenny Bernstein, that he wants the kind of attention? He wants people to take note of this remark? Oh, moment? sure. Oh, of course, yes. He loves it. He's just like, he makes fun of himself. He says he's like a little... All right, we just have a couple minutes left, but I want to go very quickly over this very strange relationship with his daughter. His daughter committed suicide, didn't she? Apparently, uh -huh. apparently. What was that strange relationship? She was a very unhappy child. I remember that Horowitz's cousin once told me that when you mix the blood of a Tuscanini and a Horowitz, sometimes you get trouble. And she once said, somebody once said, what did you inherit from your famous forebears, meaning Horowitz and her grandfather? Mm -hmm. And she said, spastic colitis from my father and dandruff from my grandfather. She wasn't kidding, and in 1957 she had a tragic motorcycle accident from which she never completely recovered. And by 1974 she was simply in and out of sanitariums, uh, very uh, sick physically, and she apparently did commit suicide. And by the way, a few days after her death, Horace was absolutely up. Oh, I won't be able to play in Houston. Uh, next week but the week after and he, w he said to a friend of mine that her, uh, my wife's daughter died yeah he, he really never got close to her at all no this doesn't mean he didn't care for her but it was difficult is it possible to sum up briefly what is Vladimir Horowitz really like he's complicated he's complicated he's a great musical genius he's a very I think selfish person, but for good reason. Anyone who's in the public eyes, you know, has to protect themselves to some extent. He has never, I don't think he has a mean bone in his body, and the book has been considered controversial mainly because uh, it talks not only about his strengths, but about his weaknesses. Mm -hmm. Oh, people don't like that. Yeah, the book has been called, as I said, the most controversial biography ever written. Again, I, I was sort of touching up before, and I need a fairly quick answer on this one. Doesn't it bother you that you invaded this man's privacy? No. Not and it's least. not because I'm unconscionable. It's because the book is done sympathetically, in good taste, accurately, and a public person like Horowitz, who has enjoyed being a public person, knows that he has to uh, be the subject of a book. And if it had to be a book, I, I know that it would be a better book written by a musician. Mr. Plaskin, thank you for talking with us this morning. Thank you. Glenn Plaskin, the bi biographer and the writer of Horowitz, a biography. It's 26 past the hour.